Hello everyone, we will present about compromising the MacOS kernel through Safari by chaining six vulnerabilities. Before jumping to the talk, let me introduce ourselves first. Uh, we are PhD students at Georgia Tech, working with Professor Tesu Kim. We are in SS lab at GATEC, and we believe it's one of the best information security labs in the world. We also play CTF as team rudimentary. You remember that DEFCON root won DEFCON CTF 2018. Actually, DEFCON root is the union team of DEFCON and rudimentary, which is our team. As you know, we won in Pontoon 2020 by demonstrating Safari exploit. We got RCE and also escalated privilege to corner as per after escaping from sandbox. We used six unique vulnerabilities in our exploit chain and won 70k USD. Also, we got second place in Master of Pawn. We want to emphasize two things. Our submission was the only browser category submission in Pontoon 1 this year. Also, it was the largest payout for a single target in this year's Pawn to Own. I think many people are interested in how we prepared Pawn to Own. We prepared it for a month. To find the vulnerabilities, uh, we considered the three methods, forging, code QL, and manual analysis. Uh, we found several bugs by forging, but they were not exploitable. Code QL looked great, but we didn't have the time to run. So, most of our findings come from manual analysis. Uh, we had frequent yet quick meetings to share information among members to fully utilize the short preparation time. Uh, we selected Safari as a target because we were interested in broader exploitation and more familiar with nix like OS. Also, previous experience about Safari exploitations helped us to select Safari as a target. This is high-level overview of our full-chain exploit using six vulnerabilities. First, we exploit a zip bug in a JavaScript engine to get RCE in web process of Safari by visiting our web page. Then, using our third bug, heap overflow in CVM server, we, got, we get arbitrary code execution in CVM server. And then, we execute our app using our second bug, a logical bug in Safari's broker process. However, the ex execution is blocked by first time app execution protection in the macOS. So we used our fourth bug to bypass this. Now we have code execution as an unprivileged user without sandbox. After that, we use our fifth bug, a race condition bug in CF preference daemon to escalate privilege to root. Finally, we exploit our sixth bug in kernel extension load binary to get kernel code execution and disable SIP. Uh, let me explain first bug in our exploit chain, RCE in Safari via incorrect side effect modeling in JSC JIT compiler. For your background, there is an in operator in JavaScript. It will return true if specific property is in the object or is in its prototype chain. And this operation is usually side effect free since it's just checking whether a specific property exists. Uh, the compilation eliminates redundant checks for optimization. Uh, here is a function to be decompiled. Note that array to type is array with double, which means that all elements are double. Uh, in the first line of this function, it sets array to value with double. Uh, this will introduce type check to ensure that the type is array with double. And then there is the in operation against array one. At the end of function, array to type should be checked again to access array to element. But the check is considered as redundant if the in operator is modeled as side effect free. Uh, then. This check will be eliminated by optimization. Uh, the problem is, if such side effect modeling was incorrect, we can trigger unexpected side effect and cause type confusion. For example, we can change array to type to something else and 
access it as an old speculated type. In operator is normally side effect free, but WebKit failed to consider exceptional cases which can cause dumb events. Uh, WebKit uses PDF plugin to support an embedded PDF file. Uh, for efficiency, plugin will be initialized lazily when its internal data is used. This includes uses of in operator, and this lazy initialization triggers a dumb event. So we can register a handler for this dumb event and invoke arbitrary JavaScript code to cause side effect. Uh, the interesting thing about this bug is that it can't be discovered by forging the JavaScript engine itself. So JS form forge, forgery, code alchemist, and Superion can't find this bug since PDF plugin is not part of JavaScript, JavaScript engine. Uh, how did you find this? Manually. So how can you trigger this bug? First, load PDF using embed tag. Then, install an event handler that triggers side effects. In operator will be considered as side effect free in JIT compilation, even though it's not. Actually, it will cause side effect, for example, uh, printing hello world in this case. Uh, we can abuse this bug to build a primitive for arbitrary code execution, which are uh, get address of and fake object. Uh, for address of primitive, we JIT compile the following function, opt. Uh, in the first line of the function, it says the array whose value is double. Uh, this will introduce type check to ensure that type is array with double. And then, uh, there is a in operation on array 1. This will be considered side effect free. However, it will trigger initialization of the PDF plugin and invoke our event handler for DOM subtree modified. This handler will put our object to the array and change the type of the array2 into array with contiguous. Type check for array2 is eliminated because of the incorrect modeling. Therefore, uh, compiled code will think array2 as an array with double. So we can return our object's address interpreted as a double in the compiled function. Fake object primitive is almost the same, uh, but in this case, we put address of our fake object to array after triggering side effect, which, con which changes type of the array to array with contiguous. Uh, from address of and fake object primitive, uh, we just reuse the existing technique to achieve arbitrary code execution. First, we leak the structure ID to bypass randomized structure ID protection and craft valid object using once technique, which is presented in Black Hat Europe 2019. Uh, then we achieved arbitrary read-write by abusing butterfly structure in JSC, similar to Nicholas exploit. Uh, finally, we overwrote JIT region to execute their code. Mm. How this is fixed? WebKit started to consider that in operator has side effects if an object's prototype is modified. So now, side effect modeling of in operator is correct. Uh, next step in our exploit chain is launching arbitrary app by exploiting a logical bug in the Paris broker process. As you know, there is a file scheme in the browser. If we use it in the Chrome, it will just show the contents of the directory in the in a browser. But in Safari, somehow it pops Finder to show the directory. We had a question, how does it happen? So we checked what is happening under the hood. Safari uses a select function to launch Finder. Uh, here is a code to handle file scheme in Safari. It gets a file pass from given URL and launches Finder using select file API. Safari opened the file in the past and it caused a, sec it caused a security issue. Uh, because of the issue, now it opens the directory containing the file. Uh, where else this function is being used? We found that uh, it is also used in another function called Safari reveal file. Uh, 
In this function, a URL will be checked using isFile package as pass function. isFile package as pass function checks whether a URL points to an app. Uh, so in this case, select file function is called with uh, URL and nothing interesting happens. But if is file package at pass returns first, then it will call select file with argument in file viewer routed at pass. After a quick experiment, we discovered that a pass is considered as an app by is file package at pass if it's a directory whose name ends with that app and uh, we can also bypass this check using simple link. Also, if select file's second argument points to an app, it will launch the app even if it's the simple link. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the renderer can make broker to call this function using Safari IPC. In short, uh, we send the IPC after making a simple link for an arbitrary app. Uh, we can launch the app. But two problems still exist to launch the arbitrary app. First, we can't create a simple link from the renderer since it's restricted by sandbox. To resolve this, we use the bug three arbitrary code execution in CVM server. Second, Apple has a mitigation called first time app protection. In particular, if an app is not signed by trusted developers, its execution will be blocked until users approve. But we were able to bypass this protection using the bug four. So, how did Apple fix this? Uh, they just removed the application launching pass. Now, Yongi will continue the rest of the presentation. I'll continue with the arbitrary code execution vulnerability in CBM service by using heap overflow bug. CBM server is an XPC service accessible from web process. This service is used to support OpenGL rendering. And we can see it is exposed in the sandbox profile code. Um, it is also sandboxed, but it has more capabilities than web process. For example, we can create a symbolic link and send a signal to other process from here. And there is heap overflow bug in CBM server. As you can see here, if we send a message with message field set to 4, then it calls a function named cpms service, uh, server service attach. All of these arguments are controllable from our XPC request. As indicated here, let's focus on framework name. In this function, it opens a file name in the form of framework name, type of CPU, user ID, and dot maps concatenated. Since framework name is controllable and there is no filter, we can make it open a file in any directory. In our case, we can create a file in the sandbox directory and make the CBM server open this file. Then CBM server reads the maps file by calculating its size based on its data. Let's look at the detail of the process. Here is the pseudocode for the binary code above. Counter and offset are read from the file, so it is controllable. Then size is computed, and it'll resize the buffer. Then it'll also read the remaining part of the file. As you can see here, size can be smaller, smaller than 80, like both counter and offset can be zero. Then size will be zero too. But the actual size to read underflows in this case, making it possible to overflow the buffer. Note that Fred also stops at the end of the file, so we can also control the size to overwrite. To exploit this, we used another handler from message number 7, which returns the Mac port to the client. A Mac port is an IPC mechanism in macOS. And there is a kind of Mac port named task port, which can be used to control a task. A task port should not be exposed to other process because it allows reading and writing, writing memory and controlling the uh, registers. So it basically means that arbitrary code execution is possible. As highlighted here, 
Let's focus on the VM part, uh, VM port variable uh, that is loaded and copied to client. As you can see here, the VM port is loaded from an array located at heap, so we can override the port value. So we first locate the valid port value using other handler. Then we override the port into the task port and send a message 7. Then the client will receive the task port of CPM server, and in this case, the client is web process. Then we can execute arbitrary code in CBM server by allocating memory and modifying threads registers. Apple patched this by checking if the real path of the map file matches, the, uh, matches to the given path. So arbitrary file open using path traversal becomes impossible. Also, they added a check for side underflow. Then we use another bug to bypass, the first time app protection. Here's a reminder that there's a first time app protection, which requires user interaction to open an application, launching for the first time. It waits a user's confirmation to click open. The question is, how is it implemented? Then let's see the process list. It turns out that the protection starts the application in the suspended state. What if it receives seekcon signal, which resumes the process? It was bypassed, so we could open our application bundle. Apple said they won't fix the bug. Here's some guess about the reasons. First, to send a signal to an application, we usually need to get code execution first. Second, kernel modification might be needed to support secure UI, and it is non-trivial to change. So if you have similar types of vulnerabilities, you can bypass the first-time app protection with this method. Let me briefly summarize our sandbox escape chain. First, we achieved code execution in web process using the first bug, and then we got code execution in CBM server as well, using bug 3. In that process, we created a symbol link pointing to an arbitrary application and sent the IPC call to Safari to launch the application. Then we sent SIGCON to it to bypass the first time app protection. Now we get code execution outside sandbox. To get root privilege, we used, uh, we used a race condition bug in CFPREF's daemon. So what is CFPREF's daemon? It is an XPC service located at Core Foundation framework. We can read or write pref preference files by sending a request. There were severe security issues, including the famous bug found by Code Colorist. And there is a wrapper function which sends the XPC request to the daemon. If a client calls this function with key value pair and destination path set, then daemon will process the request. First, it'll check if the client process can write to the file. Then, it'll try to create the directory recursively if it does not exist. In this case, it is pass2. Finally, it will write a new content to .plist file with the new key and value pair added. But how exactly it creates the directory? First, it will split the paths into parts using slash as delimiter. Then for each part, it will create a directory using NKDIR. Then it will change the permission and the owner of the folder. All of these three functions accept the paths as their arguments. But what if the created directory are replaced between mkdir and chmod? Like, we can replace the folder with a symbolic link instead. Then it'll change the permission and owner of the pointed file instead. In this way, we can make any files to be writable. At this point, 
Let's look at the comment with set UI piece named user bin login. The login command authenticates a user based on policy specified at the file named etc pam.d and login. This file specifies PAM module for authentication. For example, a module named PAM permit.so always permit access without any authentication. By overwriting this file, we can change all PAM modules into PAM permit.so. After that, just running login root command will give us a root privileged shell without asking any password. For the patch, now they use file descriptor instead to change the owner of the created folder. And this is the last bug in used in our chain. We used it to execute code in kernel, and it is a race condition bug in kextload. Before diving into the bug, let me briefly talk about system integrity protection. In macOS, having a root privilege does not mean we can execute code in kernel. Because even the root user cannot write to folders with the attribute com.apple.rootlist, and there is other protections that prevents some, uh, uh, prevents some operation. Only specially entitled binaries can write to these folders. For example, there is a command named kextlot and br 2 legacy, which is the macOS installer. And there are other programs with special entitlements. To have this entitlement, it needs to be signed by Apple. This mitigation is added from OS X 10.11, and it is called rootless. Then let me briefly introduce about the kernel extension in macOS. macOS uses many, many kernel modules. For example, there is BSD, Sandbox, and Quarantine.kext, and it contains binaries and configuration files. All folders related are protected in its IP. So, the root user cannot directly write to the kernel modules. Also, we can only load signed kernel extensions using kextload command. Then, let's look, uh, look at this command. Kextload command has a special entitlement to write a directory that is protected by SIP. So it can write to kex directories. This command loads the kernel extension after verifying code signature, and the signature check happens only in user space. The problem is, both the signature checking function and the function that loads the kex accepts the path of the folder. Therefore, a race condition could possibly happen. To prevent this, it uses a mitigation called staging. Like, it'll use read-only copy in SIP protected folder instead for verifying and loading kext. First, it'll copy kext to SIP protected directory. Then it'll verify and load the copy instead of using the original one. An attacker cannot modify kext file between verifying and loading because of SIP. So it means that we failed to exploit the race condition. But there are two problems in staging mechanism. The actual steps are, first, it copies our kext file into SIP protected folder named the library stage extensions. Note that the path is preserved except the base file name, which is replaced into a temporary name with UUID. Then it verifies the code signature. If it fails, it deletes them. If it succeeds, it moves them into library staged extensions tmpa.kext. Then it'll load the kernel extension. The first problem is it copies all of the files, including the symbol link files. Second problem is we can actually avoid kext load from deleting them by killing the process before step 3. It is possible because both of the attacker process and kext load process are running in the same account, which is root. So our plan is, we place the symbol link under the kext bundle, then run the command. It'll first copy them like this. 
and we kill the process before it deletes them. Now, we have SIP protected symbolic link file. Then we run the command again. In this time, a kex under the symbolic link. It will copy b.kex under the folder named symlink to the destination path, which is under the symbolic link file. By doing this, we can get a staged kex folder inside the right hole folder, and it is no longer protected by SIP. And we used another technique to improve the chance to win the race. We abused the sandbox feature to intercept some activity of process. First, we can prevent deleting staged files by terminating kex load. Like we can stop uh, 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 like we can uh, do that. Uh, 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 we can do that by denying all link and send termination signal. Second, we can stop after every file read to replace files after code sign check. We can send stop signal after reading specific file by using this rule. This technique is inspired by code colorist as a HITB, pro uh, HITB presentation in 2019. So by attacking race condition, we could lo load unsigned kernel extension for example, we could use unrootlist.kex from Linux Sans, which disables SIP by modifying the kernel memory. And the patch was, they made another read-only copy in SIP protected folder in different form. In this time, they replaced leftmost path to random one to prevent this attack. And here is our demo video. We first check the version of macOS and Safari. Then we navigate to the attacker server. It first gets code execution, and we escape sandbox by attacking Safari and CVM. Then the calculator is popped outside sandbox. In the background, it tries to escalate its privilege to root, then finally, kernel. And it shows a terminal showing that SIP became disabled by running code in kernel. So our conclusion is, we discussed six vulnerabilities and their exploitation used in Pwn21 2020 to compromise Safari with escalation of kernel privilege. They show difficulties in protecting a large and complicated system. We open source our exploit chain to foster further research. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah, it seems like uh, we don't have any questions yet. Okay, uh, we got one question uh, from chat. Uh, can you drop your uh, GitHub link in here? Um, okay, uh, I'll pa paste the link to the chat. Um, got another question from chat. Uh, it is 
It is what was the motive for this research? Mm, actually, uh, Ponto, uh, participating in Ponton is uh, one of the dream for a hacker. So uh, I think uh, that's the motivation. Um, yeah, the, the, another question is, I've looked at the GitHub link provided and it seems the web is not public yet. When I look at it, um, okay, so uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm talking with uh, teammates to publish, uh, publish the exploit chain. So, so, so I think uh, it'll be public uh, after uh, about some minutes later, I guess. I think it'll be pub public uh, during uh, public uh, today. Yes. Um, okay. Oh. Uh, do you think the move by Apple to ARM64 CPUs will make exploitation of this kind of chain more challenging? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, because uh, we needed to uh, make some pointer differences work uh, when using CBM ser uh, when exploiting CBM server. So if if uh, some mitigations like pointer authenticate code is applied, then I think the exploitation will be uh, harder. Um, and the question, another question is, uh, what prompt, prompted you look at the CVM server? Um, actually, we uh, looked at uh, many devils, and CVM server is one of them. And we found the vulnerability in CVM server, and we promptly, promptly to exploit it, and it was success. Uh, so at first we we try to look at XPC and MIG demos uh, because there were some existing research around that. So yeah, uh, I think yeah, this can be answer. Um, okay. Ah, uh, uh, I missed a, a question. So. Can you talk about how you go through manual finding a bug? Like what you what you you do to get started? Um, yes. So first, we listed uh, all of the open the demos that is exposed to vendor process, and then we uh, and then we uh, actually made a folder to uh, nightly uh, just send some requests to that, but it does. Does not uh, uh, it does not work well. Uh, so I try to examine each demo to figure out our folder is running correctly, and uh, it related to me to reverse engineer each demo in more detail. Um, okay, uh, we got another question. Have you tested this box on iPhone? Do they work? Uh, actually, uh, we couldn't because we don't have a uh, debugging environment for iPhone yet. Uh, but uh, I've saw some ad advisory on iOS acknowledging our bug. So I think something would work, but I think the exploit chain would be completely different, I guess. And uh, thank you for the appreci appreciation. Uh, 
I'm glad that you enjoyed our talk. Uh, and for the link, uh, 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 I'm actually finding the location of our site. So um, uh, I think the web will be also public in a few minutes. So I think uh, we can put the link uh, after making it public. So just for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I, f I found a link, so I'll post it into the chat. Uh, let's note that uh, this is not made, uh, made in public. Uh, we're uh, we are still cleaning up some. Mm, okay, the question is, uh, what resources do you recommend for researchers getting started with macOS? Um, uh, actually, uh, for uh, for all areas of research, I I'd recommend uh, uh, googling for some previous works on that area, that area. Um, um, I think we are running out of time. Uh, but specifically, uh, uh, we've saw some researches uh, done by. Uh, Phonex and some articles in Objects and yeah, and there's uh, much uh, there's many other resources. So I think you can uh, you can read that. Yeah.
Uh, okay. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to our presentation. <laughs>